This is an audio review of Chapter 8, Sampling, for CRJU340. So in this chapter, we're going to cover how the logic of probability sampling makes it possible to represent large populations with small subsets of those populations. We're going to talk about the criteria for sample quality and the degree to which it's representative of the population. Um, we're going to look at some of the principles of probability sampling and describe how probability sampling methods make it possible to really understand the dimensions of these things and really how our ability to estimate population parameters is rooted in sampling distributions and probability theory. So that's exciting to look forward to. And then we'll go through a couple examples of those. Okay, so the logic of probability sampling, right? First, before we jump in, you know, how do we actually collect representative data? This is fundamental to research within criminal justice field, or really in general, when we're looking at the social world. A critical part of criminal justice research is deciding what will be observed and what won't. So sampling is the process of selecting those observations. And sampling ordinarily is used to select observations for one or of two related reasons. The first is that it's often not possible to collect information from everyone or every unit that we wish to study. And it's often not necessary to do so either. So probability sampling techniques give us this ability to make relatively few observations, but then generalize from those observations to a much wider population. Probability sampling cannot be used in some situations, so we'll talk about some of the non-probability sampling techniques in a moment. But really, the overall goal of sampling is to reduce or at least understand potential biases that may be at work in who you select to be a part of your study. Okay, so jumping back into the logic of probability sampling here. Probability sampling helps researchers generalize from observed cases to unobserved ones. In selecting a group of subjects for a study, social science researchers often use some type of sampling. So sampling just refers to selecting part of a population. In selecting samples, we want to do two things. Right? We select a sample that represents some larger population of people or other things. So for example, if you wanted to know what are the conditions at a particular prison, then you would draw a sample of inmates and ask them questions to see what the conditions are like. Then we would move to the second reason for sampling, that we want to generalize from that sample to an unobserved population the sample is intended to represent. So in this example, we observe a representative sample of inmates and we take their responses and extrapolate that to the larger person population so that we don't have to do the research with each individual inmate, just a representative sample of inmates, and we'll have enough information to apply those findings to the overall target population. So in order to take what we see in our sample and extrapolate it to a target population, you need to use probability sampling. So this is a method of selection where each member of the population has a known chance or probability of being selected. If all members of a population are similar in all aspects, then you don't really need sampling procedures. So if the population has the same demographic characteristics, same attitudes, same experiences, same behaviors, and so on, you might not need sampling. But overwhelmingly, populations differ on all of these characteristics. And as we've discussed before in this class, we need to make sure we're measuring what we intend to measure. So if the sample is somehow so different than the target population, such as the age of respondents, then we may be measuring the impact of age more than the impact of our variables in the research itself. Researchers have to take time and carefully construct sampling frames and do sample estimates so they can be sure that the findings they get after using probability sampling can be applied to the larger target population, which is of course the ultimate goal, right? Especially in quantitative research methodologies. So the sample of individuals that researchers take from a population has to reflect that population. So how do researchers do that? First, they need to provide useful descriptions of the total population so they can check and make sure that the sample contains essentially the same variations that exist within the overall population. For instance, if I'm doing research on college students who are predominantly in their 20s, but the sample I draw from consists only of older students who are also enrolled with younger students, then what I find from the observations of that sample may not accurately reflect the target population. But if I make sure the sample is balanced in age of respondents, so that a few older students are represented but the younger ones are as well, 
I can better apply my findings from the sample to the larger group I'm studying, in this case, college students. Okay, then looking at conscious and unconscious sampling bias. So in connection with sampling, bias simply means that those selected are not typical or representative of the larger population from which they've been chosen. This kind of bias is virtually inevitable when a researcher picks subjects casually. So it may be an issue of convenience. You sample those who are easiest to contact or the first ones you come in contact with. Again, you have to think, are these people different in some way from the overall population? So for instance, if I sample probation officers and I just go with who responds to me first, maybe I end up with a sample that's skewed in some way. For instance, if the majority of respondents were white, but the target population of probation officers includes 20% of probation officers who were Latinx, but none of the people in my sample are Latinx, then that exclusion alone may impact the research findings and create an inconsistency between my sample and my population. Then there's also the personal bias that can affect a sample. So this is my beef with a lot of political polling, where they decide to set up like which polling place in which neighborhood they set up at matters or who they feel comfortable stopping and asking and versus who they don't, right? Who they do not stop really can affect what they find. And the news media often use these biased figures as gospel. And yet in recent election cycles, predictive polls have been way off of the real results in a lot of you know, cases, which shows there's probably errors in who they're asking or maybe with what they're asking, like the questions themselves. And that translates to skewed or just not fully reliable findings. So possibilities for inadvertent sampling bias are endless and not always obvious. Even when we plan and try our best, it can happen. So it's integral that we know what it is and you know try our best to plan to prevent that. So I almost skipped representativeness there, which is really important. So um, when you look at representativeness and probability of being selected, a sample should be representative of the population from which it's selected. And how do you know if that's the case is if the aggregate characteristics of the sample are pretty close to the same aggregates of the actual population. So the book example is if women are close to 50% of the population you're researching, then you'd want your sample to be close to 50% female so that your sample is an accurate slice of that larger population, or as they call it in statistics, is representative of the population. Representativeness is limited to the characteristics that are relevant to the interests of the study. So this means that they may be representative, they may not be representative of all aspects, right? But the sample is representative when it comes to the factors that are relevant to or at play within that research study. A basic principle of probability sampling is that a sample will be representative of a larger population. And the big part of that is if each person has an equal chance from that population of being selected for the sample. So equal probability of selection method just means if all members of the population have an equal chance of being selected, then you can be fairly confident the sample reflects the po overall population pretty well. And there's some advantages to that. Typically more representative samples, then they're going to avoid bias, right? So instead of picking people who are convenient, asking the first 10 people you have contact with, right? You're going to use a measure that gives you an equal probability that anyone in this group could be selected, right? And so to take that to the easiest example that we'll talk about later, the idea of, you know, you put everyone's name in a hat and everyone has the same chance of being picked, right? That's going to give you more representative sample. And so we can estimate the accuracy of representativeness. And we'll talk a little bit about that by jumping into probability theory. Let's brush up on our knowledge of probability theory. <laughs> okay, so, you know, probability theory really gives us inferences about how sample data is distributed around the value found in the larger population. So to better understand how this works, we need to understand the terminology, the elements of probability theory. So first up, you have sample elements. This is the unit about which information is collected and that provides the basis of analysis. So in survey research, elements typically are the people or certain types of people. However, other kinds of units can be elements for criminal justice research, like 
you know, correctional facilities could be a unit of research, street blocks, terrorist incidents, for example. Elements and units of analysis are often the same in a given study. Population just refers to the specified grouping of study elements. So this could be like, if I, again, if I want to study college students, that may be too vague though, right? It may be better to say, okay, I'm going to study students majoring in politics, administration, and justice. Or, you know, maybe just students in that major, but are only seniors, right? So you pick your population, and your population parameter is the value given for a variable in a population. So a descriptive measure of the entire population is a parameter. So for instance, um, how many seniors within politics, administration, and justice are there, right? Or maybe what's the age range of students enrolled within this discipline? So an important portion of criminal justice research involves estimating population parameters on the basis of sample observations. So moving on, sample statistic is just a summary description of a given variable in the sample. So sample statistics are used to make estimates of population parameters. So for instance, if I'm comparing the age distribution of a sample to that of the larger population, then you would have your age parameter for that population. The ultimate purpose of sampling is to select a set of elements from a population in such a way that descriptions of those elements or the sample statistics accurately portray the parameters of the total population from which the elements are selected. So the, again, the key to the process is random sampling, or random selection, I should say. <laughs> random sampling, that's slightly different. Um, each element has an equal chance of being selected, independent of any other. And the reason this is, again, good is because it serves as a check on our bias, either unconscious or conscious. And we're really drawing upon probability theory that helps us estimate population parameters and how accurate our statistics are likely to be. So a sampling distribution is a probability distribution of a statistic that's obtained through repeated sampling of a specific population. So it describes a range of possible outcomes for a statistic, such as the mean or mode of some variable of a population. So in your chapter, they talk about the sampling distribution of 10 cases, this illustrated example in the chapter, using figures 8.3, 8.4, 8.5, and 8.6. This gives some clarity to what we're covering here and how it works using different sampling strategies and using more samples to show how that changes and what you find in the research. It'd be redundant to also break this down here, so you know I can't really improve upon the visuals from the chapter. But if you're struggling with these concepts, this illustration in this section can be a really helpful way to better understand the dimensions of the topic. So back to sampling distribution. You're looking at the range of the sample statistics that you obtain if you select many samples. So the chapter discusses looking at from sampling distribution to parameter estimates by using a more realistic sampling situation. So they give an example of what you would do if you're trying to study the population of Placid Coast, California, to assess the levels of approval or disapproval of a proposed law that would ban the possession of assault rifles within the city limits. So the target population for that sample would be all adult residents of Placid Coast, California. So in order to draw a sample, we would need a sampling frame. So sampling frame just is a list of elements of a population. In this example, it's about voting. So you would look up how many people are registered to vote in this area, and you would use being registered to vote as an element of the research. Because you wouldn't want like children to be part of the research who are not eligible to vote, or people who aren't planning to vote for whatever reason. And the variables being researched is support or opposition to the new proposed law. So this is an easy one because it's binomial meaning there's just two choices. It's either support or against. Then you would select your random sample of 100 people to estimate the population parameters for approval of, or, you know, and disapproval, basically, of that proposed law. So to create the sampling frame, you get a list of all those people who register to vote, and often you're gonna use a computer program to generate random numbers. Then you would interview the people whose numbers were selected randomly from that long list. So maybe that sample is split like 50-50, right? So like 50% of the people are like, I support it. 50% of the people are like, I don't support this new law. So you take another sample of 100 people. 
but that one split 5248. So to figure out what's really going on with support, you drum more and more samples of the 100 registered voters each and put that sample statistic into a summary graph. And the more you take these samples, the more it can actually increase your range of responses. But when they collect around that, that mean, you can see you know, much more about the support of an individual measure. Right? So a few people will say, no, I don't support it at all. And yeah, your range will spread. But as you can see in the figure in your book, they start to group. And that gives you even visually a pretty good basis of understanding what people's you know, response to that actual legislation would be. OK, let's jump into estimating sampling error. So again, um, in many independent random samples are selected from a population, then the sample statistics provided by those samples will be distributed around the population parameter in a known way. So again, using that example in the book from figure 8.9 from that last one I was talking about support or against that law, you can see answers are most grouped around 50% value, more so than any other place in the graph. So probability theory gives us a formula for estimating how closely the sample statistics are clustered around a true value. So I put that in here on your slide, um, and that hopefully, you know, a visual illumination of what we're talking about. So standard error is a measure of sampling error that gives us a statistical estimate of how much a member of a sample might differ from the population that we're studying just by chance. So larger samples usually result in smaller standard errors. In probability theory, the standard error is a valuable piece of information because it indicates how closely sample estimates will be distributed around a population parameter. So here you can see in the visual graph here, approximately 34% of the sample estimates will fall within one standard error increment above the population parameter, while another 34% will fall within one standard error increment below the parameter. So standard error has an inverse function on sample size, right? Meaning the larger the sample size, the less the error. Because of the square root operation, the standard error is reduced by half if the sample size is quadrupled. Of course, this discussion illustrates only the logic of probability sampling. It doesn't describe the way research is actually conducted, right? Usually we don't know the parameter. We conduct a sample survey precisely because we want to estimate that value. Also, we don't actually select large numbers of samples often. Sometimes we only select one sample. And so what probability theory does is provide the basis for making inferences about a typical research situation. And knowing what would be likely to happen, you know, if you, especially, you know, depending on how much, how many samples you're selecting or how many people you're selecting in your sample, you know, if you select thousands of samples, <laughs> right, these, this knowing what it would be like um, in these different mathematical situations allows us to make assumptions about the one sample that we do select and study. OK, moving on to confidence levels and confidence intervals. So these provide the basis for determining the appropriate sample size for our study. Probability theory specifies 68% of a fictitious large number of samples will produce estimates that fall within one standard error of the parameter. So again, that's basically just combining these two 34%, right? So confidence level increases as the margin of error is extended. So really, confidence interval is just a range of confidence. You can say, you know, basically, depending on your research, I'm 68% confident <laughs> that what I found here is accurate, right? So once we decide on the sampling error we can tolerate, then we can calculate the number of cases that we need for our samples. Moving on to populations and sampling frames. So different types of probability sampling designs can be used alone or in combination for different research purposes. So again, a, a sampling frame is just a list or a quasi list of elements from which a probability sample is selected. So example could be, again, if I want students to be my my um, population, 
then maybe the email list of all students is my sampling frame. It's just like a list I can pull from for that population. It could be phone numbers of people in a particular area, or even like a list of registered gun owners, right? Some sort of list of folks that you can pull from. So properly drawn samples provide information that's appropriate for describing the population of elements that compose the sampling frame. Sampling frames are operational definitions of a study population. So they serve as a real world version of an abstract study population. So your abstract population can be college students, but the people you randomly choose from that list of email addresses or maybe phone numbers that are listed with student contact info, the people you actually reach, reach out to, that becomes your sample that you get from your frame. In this case, a list of people you draw from. Okay, so let's jump into some of these types of sampling and go through them each. So you have simple random sampling. This is the foundation of unbiased sampling. It could be you use a random number generator to send emails to people on that list. This is the equivalent, again, of putting everyone's name in a hat and picking out a name where each person has an equal chance of being selected. But this really isn't used as much as the next type of sampling, which is systemic, or sorry, systematic sampling. This is used more commonly by researchers because researchers can choose all elements of a list for inclusion in the sample. And in practice, it's virtually identical to simple ram random sampling, um, but it's superior in some ways in terms of convenience. Also, um, the real danger is periodicity, where you have to just make sure that if you're specifying for elements of the list, you're not creating another situation of bias or picking people that aren't representative. Stratified sampling is when you select an appropriate number of elements from a homogenous subset of the population. So the idea here is to organize the population into subsets and to select the appropriate number of elements from each. So stratified sampling means that you have representation of the stratification variables to enhance representation of other variables related to them. As a whole, a stratified sample is likely to be more representative on a number of variables than just a simple random sample. So here I have you know, stratified random sampling visualized a little bit different than cluster sampling. Right, so cluster sampling, often referred to as multi-stage cluster sampling because it's done in multiple stages, right? Cluster sampling is just basically sampling of groups of elements followed by the selection of elements within each of these selected clusters. So for instance, instead of this one on the slide here, it could be, let's say you want a national thing, we'll talk about an example of that in a minute, then maybe one city block would be a cluster that you'd pull from, right? You create that one grouping as something to be sampled to represent that particular area. So this can, this is often used, you use cluster sampling when you just don't have a list, right? When you go back to simple random sampling or systematic sampling, this is typically when you have like a list of people, like a list of emails, a list of phone numbers, something that's like a list. For cluster sampling, you don't have that right? Either it's impossible or impractical to have that list. So you basically sample these clusters and then, or what, what they call sampling units. And you're going to do this in a couple steps, right? And then basically make sure that, you know, um, you're adjusting for any of those sampling errors that can come from this, meaning you just want to make sure that that cluster represents the population, right, that you're trying to measure and that the sample elements that are selected within a cluster represent all the elements in that cluster. So a general guideline for cluster design is to maximize the number of clusters selected while decreasing the number of elements within each cluster. So we're gonna get, go through a real example of this in a moment. I mean, multi-stage cluster sampling is done a lot and you know stratification of that takes place at each level of sampling. So let me give you an illustration of that because I know it's a lot of terminology. So first, if you think of the National Crime Victimization Survey that we've talked about so far in this class. So the goal, right, of the NCVS is to represent the population of people that are 12 and older who live in households across the U.S. So they don't 
have the, you know, there's not everyone being sampled in this, right? You're not sampling people who are homeless. You're not sampling the incarcerated people in institutional settings like the military. And there's no national list of households to pull from, right? Or a list that says, here's all the residents that live in each house. Um, so they use multi-stage cluster sampling to basically create that sampling frame, right? So multi-stage cluster sampling, they start with to determine who is given the survey, right? And who becomes a participant of the research itself. So first they use primary sampling units to make a national sampling frame. So they split the primary sampling units based on the kind of area you live in, right? So they split it into large metropolitan areas, non-metropolitan areas, and, you know, uh, basically rural areas. So this way they can make sure they're getting a national sample but think about how much the area someone lives in, if it's rural, if it's a huge city like LA, can affect experiences. So they take cluster samples so they can better figure out the sample based on the numbers of people to draw from in those areas. So then the next part of setting up a survey like the NCBS is using four different sampling frames for each primary sampling unit. So they have to go through all of these steps outlined in the chapter because there's no easy list to pull from with this information available. So they have to use census records and then make a group quarters frame, make a building permit frame and a census block frame. So they can basically create a list with up to date addresses that they can use to, you know, send the survey to, right? So they have to draw large samples to reduce that sampling error and make sure they can represent the experiences of the nation, right? So, Alternatively, there's the British Crime Survey, or actually more modernly called the Crime Survey for England and Wales. And they use a slightly different approach. Of course, think about it this way. How much smaller is England and Wales <laughs> right, than the U.S.? So if you're doing a multi-stage cluster for the U.S., you, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of different areas, right? But England and Wales pretty small. So the way that they approach it for their crime survey is a little bit different. So they use postcode addresses so basically, similar to our zip code system that we have here in the US, British people have these postcode addresses that are easily defined clusters of addresses in a geographic area, right? Like think about like a zip code. You can say, okay, I'm gonna measure by zip code. So before the uh, crime survey for England and Wales was changed due to budget cuts, they also included what they called booster samples. So this increased respondents who increased responses from respondents that were ethnic minorities between the ages of 16 and 24, largely because police wanted to see if those groups were experiencing issues of victimization based on their identities. And so the ethnic minority booster was accomplished by first selecting respondents using the formal sampling procedures. Then interviewers would seek out information about four housing units adjacent to the selected unit in an effort to determine if any residents were non-white. If adjacent units had minority families, then they would also be interviewed for the ethnic minority booster sample. So this is an example of what Thompson calls adaptive sampling, meaning probability samples were first selected, but then the respondents that were used to identify other individuals had to meet some criteria. In this case, being 16 to 24, being an ethnic minority, right? So increasing the number of respondents age was simpler. Interviewers just sought additional respondents in the age group within sampled households. So one final sampling dimension that the you know, CSEW does um, is reflecting the regional organization of the police in England and Wales. So basically, they, they divide the area into 42 different police areas and they further stratify this to produce 650 interviews within each police area so that they can support an analysis within each one, right? Basically, they create a situation so that you're not comparing apples to oranges. That's like the easiest way I can break that down. So after individual households are selected, one person age 16 or older is randomly chosen to provide information for the entire household. And since 2009, children ages 10 to 15 have also been sampled from some households. And sample sizes have been cut pretty much in half because of those budget cuts. So that has obviously affected 
you know, what, what they can show or what they can demonstrate from this. So although sampling designs for both of these different crime surveys are complex, much more complex than what we talk about in the chapter, it's just important to understand how multi-stage cluster sampling is used. And the real difference between the two is that for the British version, they have a list pretty much. I mean, they don't, but they have like an easier version of that with their kind of like zip code, you know, version than what happens for the NCVS. And again, largely because if you're looking at it as a national level for, you know, basically England and Wales versus <laughs> versus the entire United States, I mean, there's probably less people in England and Wales than there are in California. So think about just the kind of scale to which this research has to be done means that there has to be, you know, much more metrics in place to provide in this information. As we talked about before, having information from these sources is, is integral, especially we use the NCVS here all the time for criminal justice research because it often fills in the gaps of what's known or what's reported to police, kind of getting at that, you know, dark figure of crime, of the things that go unreported or just unsolved that we don't know about, right? So these are very valuable um, information sources that we use all the time, but again, how how accurate can they be? It really is a measure of how thoughtfully planned are they before they're executed. Okay, and then moving on briefly to non-probability sampling. So in many research applications, non-probability samples are necessary or just the way to go. So non-probability sampling just means, you know, you're not you're not using probability as an aspect of who's being sampled. You're not doing it randomly. You're not picking people randomly out of a hat. Right. So for my own personal experiences, I've used some of these sampling techniques because I was doing more qualitative focus of research. And in those examples, sometimes people have to be of a population to actually be able to answer your question. So, for instance, if I was going to, you know, do a research study just looking for a sample of people who have been a victim of a particular crime, let's say a victim of armed robbery. Right then I'm not going to just like sample from a larger population. I'm not going to say like, okay, well, let's see everyone in Southern California. And then we'll just, you know, because again, the people that you need for the research that have the necessarily knowledge to answer your research questions have a specified knowledge, right? So sometimes we use some of these different non-probability sampling structures for some of those reasons, right? Uh, either it's we don't have access to the whole population. We don't know the size of a whole population. Like think about deviant groups. You can't be like, well, this is representative of how many drug criminals there are. Like you don't really know how many there are, <laughs> right? Because we just don't have those numbers. So in some cases, it just makes sense to use non-probability stuff. You can't, the real key difference is you cannot take what you find in this research and extrapolate it to a larger population. But that doesn't mean it's not valuable. And that doesn't mean that it's not good information we can learn from, especially in a, you know, qualitative sense. Sometimes it's not about generalizing. Sometimes it's about filling in the gap in research where we don't really understand, you know, the details, the dimensions, or it t gives you a deeper dive into these populations. So anyway, I think one of the examples from the book was like, you know, how purpose, purposive sampling is looking at the basis of knowledge of the population and its elements or the nature of the research aims itself. So if you want to study members of community crime prevention groups, right, some people are visible, but finding every person as part of that group it would be difficult to do and then pull, make a list and then pull a sample from that. So you would basically just study a sample of the most visible members, right, and collect data from them, but that might not be fully representative of the larger population. So also, you know, when you think about how criminal justice practices differ, in different areas, you know, that is going to affect the kind of ways in which we set up research studies. So there's a couple good examples from your chapter that really illustrate this. So for example, um, Lieber and Stairs were interested in how economic inequality combines with race to affect sentencing practices. And so they were specifically looking at Iowa juvenile courts. So they controlled for certain variables, right? They controlled for economic status and found that African-American defendants received more restrictive sentences than their white counterparts. So they purposively selected three jurisdictions to obtain sample elements within an adequate racial diversity of the state of Iowa, right? Because Iowa is like pretty white. 
So the researchers selected over 5,000 juvenile cases that were processed in those courts. So again, you wouldn't just like go to a general population of juveniles. You would find juvenile cases that were actually like went through a court if that's what the elements of your research is looking for. Also, sometimes, you know, when it comes to representing patterns of complex variation, right, these kind of methods are used as well. I think there's another example in your book about um, research study involving CCD projects, meaning, you know, basically um, the closed circuit television that, you know, they just put up cameras basically in a high crime area. And, you know, the researchers would just sample people that walk by. So, you know, obviously that's not a random sample, um, but it can be purposive and they can, you know, spread their interviews over certain days and times to make sure they're covering the area effectively. But it can reflect variation in the types of people that enter these areas at different times. So sampling strategies are basically adapted to the research itself. Another reason that people use uh, purposive sampling is to pretest a questionnaire. So, you know, if we want to study people's opinions about court ordered restitution for a crime, then we might want to test that questionnaire first. Again, this is a huge point in research because if you're going to waste a bunch of time and energy putting out this research, you definitely want to pretest it first to make sure that what you're measuring is what you think you're measuring, that people understand the questionnaire and that it's actually somehow reflective of the variables that you're measuring. So instead of selecting a probability sample, the general population, you want people who for some situations meet some criteria, right? So maybe people that were a victim of a crime or people who committed a crime or whatever it might be, depending on how, what you're studying. So quota sampling is a little bit different. Quota sampling begins with a matrix or table that describes the characteristics of your target population. And once you create the matrix, you assign a relative proportion to each cell in the matrix. And then you collect data from people that have the characteristics of that given cell. Then you assign all people in the cell a weight proportionate to their, to their portion in the total population. So when all the sample elements are weighted, the overall data should provide a reasonable representation of the total population. So it's not quite the same standard mathematically, but it does get you closer to that representative. Um, two problems though, is that the quota frame has to be accurate. It's often difficult to get up-to-date information for some of these figures and biases can still exist in the selection of sample elements within a given cell of the matrix. So the book example is pretty apt for this one. The book example is like, let's say I tell you, Hey, you have to go out and interview five people that meet this complex set of criteria, right? You might still avoid people who live at the top of like a 10 story building where you don't have an elevator, right? Or people that are, you know, that outside of their home is a vicious dog that's tied up that you don't want to have to walk by, right? That sometimes even the people out there canvassing and, and, you know, going to these spaces, they might select certain units more than others, just based on the kind of bias that we have of like, what's more comfortable to us to approach, which homes do we feel more comfortable to go up and ring the doorbell of, right? Also, there's an issue of, you know, sometimes it's a reliance on available subjects. So sometimes they mistakenly refer to this as convenience sampling, and it may be helpful as a method to use for a pretest of a questionnaire, but it's not going to produce information that's you know, super general of value, right? So again, if I wanted to know about Cal State Fullerton students, and if I gave a survey to everyone in this class, that might give me some information. But this class is not going to be representative of the larger student population. So the sample is not representative of the population. So maybe CRIM students differ from engineering students or art students or even sociology students, right? So I could not use those findings to generalize to the larger student population, but it will let me know if my questionnaire has issues before I distribute it to the entire school, right? So it's always a good pretest. So generally it's best justified if the researcher wants to study the characteristics of people who are, you know, basically at some point and some time, um, involved in some way with the variables. So quota sampling done a bit less, right? Snowball sampling, incredibly common in qualitative research. So snowball sampling just means you find a subject or small number of subjects, and then you ask them to identify other people like them. 
So this is often in field observation, qualitative interviewing. I've done it myself, <laughs> right? So um, this makes complete sense to use a lot of snowball sampling when it comes to criminal justice research methods. Why? Because like, let's say you want a sampling frame to develop for, let's say you want to study people who are active criminals today. Where are you going to go get that list? The list of all active criminals? There is no, there is no list, right? So instead, especially because if someone is doing something criminal or deviant, they're obviously going to hide their identity, right? They're not going to be super open about it. It's not going to be like an easy thing to find, like in the same way as like, you know, those examples from before, people who are registered voters or something like that. It's not like registered criminals. Technically, you could use people who are formerly incarcerated or things like that. But as we talked about before with that dark nature of crime, there's plenty of people that are criminals that just don't get caught. Right. So it's not you wouldn't be representative of the target population of active criminals. You'd only be representative of the population of folks who were caught. Right. Does that make sense? Hopefully. So anyway, um, for criminal justice research, it makes sense, especially if you're looking at active criminals or some sort of deviant groups that you're going to use snowball sampling techniques. And I mean, in a lesser sense, I've I, I have heard of this being used in many cases where they're just populations that are marginalized in some way, like for instance, um, people who are undocumented, right? So if I wanted to do research on what are the situations that undocumented students experience, I could start with a you know, single subject or a couple people that I know fit that criteria and then ask them, hey, do you know any other students that are undocumented that might want to be a part of my research study that fit this criteria? And then they provide you with those resources. Hence the little visual down here on the slide, right? you start with one person, they refer to you a couple people, and then those people refer to you a couple people. And um, an example I could give to you of that that's happened, at least in recent years, a friend of mine that I went to grad school with, Anna, she um, did this research study about adult professional marijuana users, people that were like in their like 40s through 60s, that were like career professionals, people that made like, I don't know, six figures, must be nice. But anyway, <laughs> people who made like a grip of money, but were like, you know, career professionals like middle management or higher in their fields. And they were daily marijuana users. And the idea was she was interested in understanding how they navigate the stigma and the deviancy around continued marijuana use and still keep this identity as a adult professional, right? So obviously you can't go to your list of like, hey, who are all the professionals that aren't telling people that they, you know, use marijuana daily, <laughs> right? You can't go to that list. The list doesn't exist. So in that situation, and because it's deviant and people would typically hide that information from others that they wouldn't trust, then it makes sense she'd start out with a couple people she knew for the research fit the criteria. And then from there, ask them, hey, can you tell me, do you know anyone else that fits this criteria? And then you snowball that, right? So you basically, like the ball rolling down the hill, you gain more and more respondents as they basically give them to you. So there's issues with the strengths and weaknesses of snowball sampling, obviously, right? It's not representative of the larger population, blah, blah, blah. But... It really, at least in my experience, um, doing qualitative interview stuff and having to use snowball sampling a couple times is that the key in my experience is, do these people trust you? Do they have a positive experience in your research study? If not, they're not going to snowball for you, right? Think about it. If you made them uncomfortable, if they just, you know, the research was burdensome and long, they're not going to be like, yeah, you know what? I'll volunteer my friends and family to be part of this. So you know, you have to be really thoughtful of your respondents and make sure that they're comfortable and that they're, you know, basically being heard and, you know, being respected as participants in the study. And then they're much more likely to feel comfortable to kind of bring this up. Because again, this is deviant stuff. Or like, you know, my mentor, when he was doing these kind of like in-depth qualitative um you know, observation and like an ethnography basically about a group of men who went from selling drugs to robbing drug dealers. And like they were literally outlining like horrible things that they had done. You're not just going to be like, yeah, I'll trust some random stranger, 
to this, right? You really have to build some rapport with these respondents so that they'll feel comfortable enough to say, yeah, you know what? I got a friend that would fit the criteria of this. And again, why would we want to know this information? Because it fills in that gap in what's reported in what we know by really getting to the root of some of these groups that are deviant or subaltern or in some way marginalized and kind of further illuminate whatever's going on within that space, right? So that's, again, non-probability sampling. You're not trying to extrapolate it back to the larger population like you are with all the other ones that we talked about in this lecture.